Hello everyone, welcome to the episode of Decoding the Unknown that is absolutely going to get me uh, all sorts of messages on Twitter that I don't want to get from people who are conspiracy theorists and are crazy. And I'm really into conspiracy theories. Believe all the wild shit that we're obviously going to disprove in today's video because we are doing the uh, somewhat requested Was 9-11 an inside job? And look, if I haven't revealed my opinion on this, it's like obviously not. And look, I'll look at some conspiracy theories and be like, there's something there. There's something there. That's a weird one. There's definitely, I, I, I don't think your specific answer to this conspiracy theory, dear tinfoil hat wearer, is correct. But I do think there's something like the JFK thing. It's like, there is some, something weird is going on there. I don't know what it is, but it's like that sh ain't added up. Like something is weird going on there. With 9-11, uh, it's just like, no, 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 no. And, um, Go! so Jaren, who, who wrote this episode, whose name is spelt very differently, and I apologize in advance if I, I screw it up again, he wrote me and he said, I really want to do this one time because I used to believe this. What did you say? And I'm like, you what now? And to be fair, I have talked about this before and I remember seeing a, a documentary when I was a teenager and I think Jaren was, was pretty young, I think, I probably mentioned this, but... I think he was young when he when he thought this and I remember being a teenager and being convinced that the moon landing was faked because I saw this documentary and it was like this happened and then this happened and there's all this evidence and I'm like oh my god it's fake and then the documentary had this crazy twist where it's like and uh no actually it was all real and here's why all of the stuff we told you in the first half is easily disprovable and um yeah and then afterwards i was like well that made me feel like an idiot but that documentary i remember to this day and it was super eye-opening so let's crack this red bull that's the sound of that the kid has been sleeping terribly <laughs> so this just living off caffeine these last couple of days it's been brutal um and what better what better time than that to jump into <laughs> this bag of worms let's go <laughs> Guys, we've talked about them before. We'll talk about them again. They are absolutely one of my favorite sponsors. It is Vessi Shoes. What are Vessis? Well, they are simply the best shoes that you will ever wear. Vessi started sponsoring me. And honestly, I'd not heard of Vessi until they started sponsoring. So it's like some sponsors I'd used before they even sponsored me, which was cool. But this doesn't matter. Why am I telling this story? It's not important. Vessi came along. They sent me a pair of shoes. I tried them out. They sponsored it me. And I have not worn enough. I mean, that's a lie. I've worn like slippers. And if I had to wear like really smart shoes I have but basically 99% of my shoe wearing has been Vessi's over the last two years they have an incredible range of shoes I had their classic pair first now I'm pretty much constantly ah uh, uh, there we go wearing this pair of Chelsea Vessi boots they're fantastic but you know they look like normal shoes but these are fully waterproof this isn't some water resistant this is Dymatex, which is the material they use. That's not important to me. What is important to me is these act like a pair of Wellingtons. I was going through, they say splash around in puddles for me to, to show you. I was in a river up to here. It's like wearing Wellington boots. It's absolutely ridiculous. They also make more regular shoes. You know, these are their sporty pair, which are great. They also have these slip-ons. These I haven't worn yet. They still smell so new, which I love. I mean... I'd love to wear them, but I keep them nice and shiny for you guys to see. Uh, I've got other pairs as well. Look, what do I have to say about Vessies other than, what is there to say? They're the best shoes. I wear nothing else. It, 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 it's not even a joke. If another shoe company came along and were like, sorry, we have to sponsor you, I'd be like, I can't. I only wear Vessies. Vessi's early Black Friday sale is on now. Vessi is giving away a pair of socks of your choice to the first 100 shoes sold using my special code, unknown. Get the style and size you want before they sell out. Check out their early Black Friday sale at vessi.com slash unknown. Free shipping to... I... There's a lot of shortcuts for countries. CA? Canada? Must be. US? Obvious. Australia? Japan? TW? I don't even know. KRSGP. Look, if you're in those countries, you're going to know the shipping is free. And if your country's not on there, well, you'd know it. Like, I'm from the UK. It's not on there. Or Czech Republic, where I live now, CZ. It's not on there. Look, I know. You know. Why are we over explaining this? That's how to do it. Take advantage. Get those free socks right now. And um, yeah, Vessi.com slash unknown. Thank you, Vessi. And back to today's video. They say every American remembers the exact moment when they heard the news about the September 11th attacks. I I, I also do. I was in detention because <laughs> I was at school. It was like lunchtime. And I was, uh, I was in detention because I'd forgotten my gym kit. And I just, so I 
that was the punishment for getting my gym kit. I didn't really mind because detention's kind of worth it, but not having to do gym, or as we call it, PE, or games. It's weird that in, in the UK we call sport. Like, when you play sport in the afternoons, you'd have to, like, we'd have to do football and rugby and all of this bullshit that I hated, or cricket, God forbid. And uh, we, it was called games, which is very disappointing, because if someone told me, yeah, you've got afternoon of games, I'd be like, wicked, man. Can we play GTA 5? And they'd be like, oh, no, no, by games we mean sport. And I'm like, there are no things that are different, more different to me. They vividly recall where they were, what they were doing, and the sinking feeling in their gut as they realized the magnitude of what was happening. It's as if they all had the memory of that dreadful day seared into their minds forever. Well, except for me. I was only a year old. Whoa, Jared is young! Oh my god, I was a teenager. I'm feeling old right now. Jared was a year old, so he was born in 2000s. Amazing, like 22! <laughs> oh my god, I'm an old man. I was 14. Oh no. But growing up in the US post 9-11 meant that I heard about it all the time, especially on its anniversary, which was when schools would show students footage of the attacks and talk about it extensively. They probably went a bit over the top when they showed a bunch of 11-year-olds videos of people jumping out of the towers, but I guess it did its job because I definitely haven't forgotten about it in the years since. Come to think of it, maybe that was just my school, I never really asked anyone else. Yeah, I don't know, I lived I remember it, so I remember that happening. No one in school ever showed those videos afterwards. It was like, and these are the people trying to escape an inferno and jump into their deaths. F***ing up. Why? Why? I mean, never forget. Completely agree with that sentiment. But also, do we really need... It's like there was a plane crash. We don't need to look at the bodies. Why would we do this? One thing it certainly accomplished, though, was getting me to do a bit of research on my own outside of school, and boy, is the internet a wonderful place for an impressionable young mind. I quickly came across the vast conspiracy surrounding the 9-11 attacks, and as I delved deeper and deeper, I became more and more convinced that they must have been true. The government and media were a bunch of liars. The public were a bunch of mindless sheep. And I was among the only enlightened, free-thinking intellectuals who knew the truth. I've mentioned this before. There's a certain member of my family who, uh, like, believes in, in this. And not a dumb person. Smart man. Very smart man. And, but it's just like, there's that part of your brain which this appeals to. And it's just like some people just, that activates for them. And it's just weird. And I'm just like, okay, mate, <laughs> just believe whatever you want to believe. But good Lord, no, like you're in the minority. Thankfully, I've distanced myself from conspiracy theories since then. And these days, I don't place very much faith in any of the major ones. But even without me, in recent years, conspiracies about 9-11 have only gotten more popular with a survey a couple of years ago showing that as many as half of all Americans believe the government is hiding something about that infamous day. Well, that's fine. That's very different from believing believing like that it was it's not black and white it's not like it was a conspiracy theory and it was perpetrated by the u.s government to launch a war in afghanistan for some reason <laughs> which is like yeah because that worked out great two trillion dollars down the hole later i i just for, for, for god knows what reason but like believing that the government's hiding something sure okay yeah there's probably tons of shit that the government's hiding about all sorts of benign shit. But it's not like to the extent that they perpetrated it. Maybe there's just something that they don't want you to know about. That's fine. I could totally, I, I probably believe that. I probably fall into that half. Do I believe that the major the vast majority of what's presented as the truth is the truth? Yes, entirely. But I am a sheep. <laughs> Personally, I don't think the number is that high, but it's definitely up there, so there's a big chance that some viewers are watching right now even hold some of the beliefs we'll go over in this episode. Today, we're going to crack open the huge can of worms that is 9-11, covering everything from the more common CIA planting bombs in the towers and George Bush planning the whole thing, all the way to the more ridiculous, the more ridiculous, <laughs> George Bush plan 9-11, the CIA planted bombs. That is already on the scale of one to ridiculous. That is mega in the ridiculous level like alien involvement and of course simon's favorite prophet nostradamus oh yeah but these are just like obviously silly i mean the george bush thing is obviously silly but these are like not no that's that's not not where a part of your brain is broken but that's like no you are stupid so catastrophically stupid that's just that's not what i was saying about my uh family member who's smart but has that part of his brain broken this is like no 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 this that's for dumb people the nostradamus stuff is for dumb people We'll do our best to leave no stone on turns and hopefully put some of these mysteries to bed once and for all. So, is there more to 9-11 than meets the eye? Let's find out. The official narrative. 
Before we get into the supposed plot holes, <laughs> let's start with the story of what happened that day, or what some would call the official narrative. Between about 8 a.m. and 8.40 a.m., four passenger jets, two Boeing 767s and two 757s take to the skies on what probably feels like a fairly normal day. The sun is shining, the sky is blue, and the temperature is nice and cool. The two 767s, the American Airlines Flight 11 and United Airlines Flight 175, both take off from Boston and are expected to arrive in Los Angeles. The two 757s are American Airlines Flight 77, taking off from an airport in Virginia, also heading to Los Angeles, and United Airlines Flight 93, taking off from New Jersey and heading to San Francisco. Within an hour and a half, all four of these planes will be hijacked by a total of 19 members of Al-Qaeda, armed with an assortment of box cutters, pepper spray, and mace. Bomb threats were also made, but it has never been determined if the bombs were legitimate or not. At 8.46 a.m., Flight 11 crashes into the north base of the North Tower at an angle that smashes through multiple floors between the 93rd and 99th. Traveling at around 500 miles an hour and loaded with thousands of gallons of jet fuel, the explosion is the equivalent to 480,000 pounds of TNT. A huge fire erupts, and first responders start heading for the site. Then, just 60 minutes later, the South Tower is hit by Flight 175, crashing between the 77th and 85th floors, resulting in a similar explosion and an equally massive fire. Evacuations are now underway in both towers, but between the thousands of people fleeing fire, smoke, and debris, many people are either trapped on their floor or slowly waking, making their way out with the crowds. People above the impact points have little chance of escape. In the North Tower, not a single person makes it out from these doomed floors, and in the South Tower, it's only 18. As the nation watches the towers burn in the news, another target is struck. At 9.37, Flight 77 crashes into the Pentagon. At this point, U.S. airspace is completely shut down. Most incoming flights are, and all aircraft in the sky are ordered to land at the nearest airport, but it's already too late. Just before 10 a.m., the South Tower begins to crumble and completely collapses, forever disappearing from the New York City skyline, followed soon by the North Tower just 30 minutes later. As the North Tower collapsed, heavy debris smashed into another nearby building, Seven World Trade Center, also known as Tower 7, causing fires and serious structural damage that led to its collapse later that day. Just before the North Tower falls, the last hijacked plane, Flight 93, is heading for the final target, which was later determined to be either the White House or the U.S. Capitol. But as the jet cruises over Pennsylvania, the passengers, who had heard about the other attacks when calling their loved ones, decided to take matters into their own hands. While fighting to regain control of the plane, Flight 93 goes down, crashing into a field and killing everyone on board. In total, 2,996 people died in the attacks, around 6,000 were injured, and in the years since, well over 1,000 people have developed cancer as a result of the dust and toxins inhaled when the towers collapsed. It is the single deadliest terror attack in history, and one of the deadliest days for the United States since the country's creation. Civilians of 102 different countries were among the dead, and as of September 2021, there are still over a thousand bodies that have yet to be identified. After examining the passenger list and identifying the hijackers, it was determined that Al-Qaeda was behind the attacks, and the United States demanded that the Taliban extradite Osama bin Laden and other perpetrators out of Afghanistan to be tried for terrorism. The Taliban refused, and so the United States led a coalition of allies to remove them from power and hunt down Al-Qaeda. This would lead to 20 years of combat in Afghanistan, kicking off the global war on terror, and would pull the US and its allies into several more military conflicts, and the world would never be the same again. Now, that's the official story. I barely interrupted it even. It's just, I, I don't feel this. You're talking about the deadliest terrorist attack ever. There's not a lot of commentary you can really add to that. And people were already questioning everything. Early websites, books, and radio stations started throwing their support behind the 9 11 Truth Movement, demanding that the government respond to accusations of involvement. One such documentary was particularly successful Loose Change. Oh, I vaguely remember hearing about this, which was released in 2005 and was quickly spread through the internet. In fact, it is one of the documentaries that I stumbled upon when I was younger, or at least so I thought. It turns out the original Loose Change had so many flaws in it that the creators ended up releasing three newer versions of it, each time updating their narrative and taking away some of the stuff that had been thoroughly disproven. But even after several segments had been cut out, the 2007 version was still more than two hours long. But don't worry, this episode won't be two hours long, and we'll do a much more honest job of covering what really happened. So, without further ado, let's dive in. Oh, Jaren, I mean, <laughs> it could be two hours long with all of my additions. No, we're okay. We're 13 minutes in. Hey, judging by how far I am down the plate, just clock in at just under an hour. Let's see how uh, I'm probably way off. Who knows? Absurdity. 
We're gonna start with the theories that are so insane that I'm not even going to bother debunking them, because if you actually believe these, you probably need to say see a psychiatrist. It's like, yeah, the Nostradamus stuff is like, he predicted in a book so many years ago that the towers... Wasn't there also a webdings thing where it's like, if you... And I can't... I don't think this was true, but it's like, if you type in the flight number and 9-11, it's got like two planes and two towers uh, in like webdings or wingdings or whatever it's called. And it's like, okay, <laughs> what's the person who made wingdings is like behind this? And it's like, yeah, no, 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 it's a coincidence. Stop it. Whatever's going on here, stop it immediately. We'll just read them off and let you make your own conclusions. <laughs> Number one, we're not going to do that. I mean, you're going to do that, Jared. And then I'm going to be like, yeah, that's crazy. If you believe this, you have a tiny brain. So let's go. Number one, it wasn't planes that hit the Twin Towers. Believers of this theory posit that instead of planes hitting the Twin Towers, it was actually missiles, presumably launched by the US government. <laughs> Except there's videos of planes crashing into towers. Like, videos. Especially the second tower. There was like, because the first one had already had a plane crash into it, there were probably hundreds or thousands of cameras pointed at it, seeing another plane crash into the second one. That's insane. Videos and photos we've seen of them were doctored to make them look like passenger jets. What, every single video that was taken? That's thousands of videos. And people on the ground were fooled by an advanced hologram surrounding the rockets. And of course, a plane didn't hit the Pentagon, but instead a long-range missile fired from a US military base. But we'll get to the Pentagon later. This is broadly known as the no-plane theory, and is actually so ridiculous that it has been banned from the more serious conspiracy sites. <laughs> Number two, it wasn't terrorists that hijacked the planes, it was aliens. This is even more. This, the first one about holograms is ridiculous. This is even more ridiculous. This theory suggests that the reason the government never released the cockpit recording of the hijacked jets is because they were speaking in an alien language. Or it's because when you crash a plane into a building, they're not going to find it. Because, I mean, can a cockpit recorder survive that? Did they survive? Surely not. They're not invincible, they're just really strong. But. It's not just got to survive a cr plane crash, it's got to survive a plane crash and then tons of kerosene burning and then a building collapsing onto it. I can't for the life, and by building I mean skyscraper. I can't for the life of me understand why aliens would fly thousands of light years through interstellar space just to steal a few airplanes and then crash them into some buildings, though I guess if it's true, then we have to blame them for the creation of the TSA. Number three, 9-11 was destined to happen because it's a f because it fulfilled prophecy. Oh, the Nostradamus thing, here we go. I'm excited, let's get it, let's get to work let's see what we gotta do yeah i tried to find the original nostradamus prediction that supposedly describes the attack but every time i found a credible sounding quote i would find another website debunking it as a fake quote there's even a quote signed nostradamus 1654 but this wasn't possible because he would have already been already been dead for more than 80 years by that time so i think we can safely write off any of this vague obnoxious prophecies one of the most widespread 9-11 visions was even put out there by a canadian graduate student show the world how easy it is to spread fake garbage on the internet. But Nostradamus wasn't the only clairvoyant to leave his mark on our story. I'd like to introduce you to Baba Vanga, a Bulgarian woman who lost her eyesight at the age of 12 when a tornado chucked her into a field. Apparently, her eyes crusted over with dirt and she never fully regained use of them. This lady honestly deserves her own episode, so we'll keep this brief, but she supposedly left predictions for the next 5,000 or so years, ending with the time when she believed the universe will end. I don't speak Bulgarian, so I don't know how her legacy has held up in her home country, but I do know she's an incredibly popular topic among Ru the Russian equivalents of the History Channel. Oh no, where experts say that her prophecies have had an 85% success rate. Oh, I'm already calling bullshit on this. It's the history, it's the Russian History Channel. It's going to be even more misinformation than the regular History Channel. So, what did she have to say about 9 11? Well, here's a quote from 1988. Horror, horror, the American be brethren will fall after being attacked by the steel birds. The wolves will be howling in a bush and innocent blood will be gushing. So the only thing is anywhere close to being relevant there is, well, it's an attack on America and steel birds could definitely be interpreted as planes. So America will be attacked with planes. That could be literally any war. Can, is there a single war where planes have existed that a country has not been attacked by steel birds? 
Chill out, lady. Chill out. I can feel Simon rolling his eyes already, so let's move on from the prophecies to get into something equally ridiculous. Anti-Semitism. Oh, there's never a good conspiracy if you can't throw some Jew hate in there. Come on. There indeed exists a conspiracy that the Jewish population in New York was warned of the attacks before they happened, giving them ample time to avoid the towers or get out of them before they were hit, especially the financial workers that had offices there. I'm seriously not making this up. Thankfully, it's easily disproven when you look at the data. Based on the victims whose religion was known, an estimated 10 to 15 percent of the victims were jewish which i would guess is like completely representative of the number of people who were jewish who worked in the building so meaning that three to four hundred of them were killed clearly they weren't warned ahead of time or that number would be zero right i mean come on this took me a simple google search and apparently the jews were warned not to show up to work that day and were told directly by in israeli intelligence who were actually the true masterminds behind the whole attack hoping to frame their enemies and get the u.s to go to war in the middle east <laughs> There's easier ways to do this. This is so stupid. These theories gain serious popularity in places like Iran. I mean, <laughs> yeah, they would. But why do they have to gain popularity elsewhere? Where news articles have randomly thrown around numbers between 500 and 10,000 Jews skipping work that day. Their source? Trust me, bro. These theories are nothing more than a convenient way to stir up anti-Semitism. In Iran? No. No. The Pentagon. Now that we've gotten those out of the way, let's tackle some of the more serious theories, ones that at least attempt to bring forward some kind of evidence. Well, <laughs> it's like they tried to bring forward evidence. It's like all the Jews did go to work. No, they did. They did. Oh, come on, bro. Trust me. Trust me. You gotta trust him. Look at those eyes. First up, let's talk about the Pentagon. The attack on the Pentagon is often overshadowed by the catastrophic tower collapses, but it's one of the main arguments in the shadowy world of conspiracies. The official narrative says that American Airlines Flight 77 crashed into the Pentagon, damaging one of the wings and starting a few fires. There are two main alternative theories on this one, but both agree that Flight 77 never crashed. The first theory says that it was instead a remote-controlled fighter jet that caused the damage, and the other slightly more popular theory states that an air-to-surface missile was fired from the wing of the passenger jet before it flew away or that a missile was fired from a military base yeah but no what about the plane and the people who died on the plane and the video of the plane <laughs> what i can i i do i do not understand and all this boils down to the impact on the building compared to the aircraft. As one author put it, how does a plane 125 feet wide and 155 feet long fit into a hole which is only 60 feet across? Um, isn't that because like the like the wings are not like if a plane slamming into a building, right? The wings are going to cause some damage, but not that much. But that center core, that's going to really like punch in there. It's a great question on the surface, because a quick glance at the hole in the Pentagon shows that it isn't quite as wide as a Boeing 757. The other piece of evidence is the grainy CCD view footage showing the moment of impact. The plane is too fast to get caught in a single frame. All we see is clear blue sky, and then suddenly in the next frame, there is an explosion. However, if you look very closely in the frame just before the explosion, a small, thin, white object protrudes from the right. Here are the before and after frames with the mysterious partial object object circled in red okay okay there we go yeah you'll see it on screen now so these are the before and after frames um all right okay these look like the same picture oh i see i see it's really small okay it's just poking in there this is apparently the nose of the plane poking in for just a brief moment but theorists believe this is inconclusive and more likely to be a missile. Other suspicious pieces of evidence include an alleged difficult air aerial maneuver, and the inexperienced hijacker pilot would have been unable to pull it off while flying that low, and also street lamps were knocked down without bringing the plane down, and no remains of the aircraft were ever located on the site. And this is where the theorists largely end their observations and begin drawing their own conclusions, but we can debunk all of this rather easily. First of all, there definitely were pieces of aircraft debris recovered at the crash site, including the black box, the landing gear, and the cockpit. Yeah, these are all major parts of planes, guys. Come on. DNA evidence was also gathered that matched the missing passengers, and even the Chinese foreign ministry confirmed the death of one of their citizens on the flight. If this was actually a conspiracy, I'd really like to know why China would want to help the United States. Yeah, this is it. It's the diplomacy that that would require would be insane and uh, impossible.
so no. As for the shape of the impact site, that's pretty easy to explain as well. Professor of Civil Engineering, Meet Sozin, said, A crashing debt doesn't punch a cartoon-like outline of itself into a reinforced concrete building. When Flight 77 hit the Pentagon, one wing hit the ground and the other was sheared off by the Pentagon's load-bearing columns. This makes a ton of sense when you remember that the pilot probably wasn't experienced enough to avoid scraping the ground a few seconds before impact. But I think there are two other serious issues with any Pentagon conspiracies. If Flight 77 didn't crash into the building, then where did it go? Was it landed somewhere else? Were the passengers disposed of? Or was it flown into the ocean? It doesn't make any sense. If you already have the plane hijacked, you might as well use it instead of setting up an elaborate scheme to hide it before using a missile instead. Not to mention, many passengers on board called their family members to tell them their plane had been hijacked, and why would they have any reason to lie? Along with the passengers, plenty of people on the ground gave eyewitness testimony of the plane crash, but conspiracy theorists just simply say that these people were confused. Mate, they are not the confused ones. <laughs> Come on. As it's just so much evidence to the contrary. It's like, why can't we just objectively look at it and be like, oh my god, there's so much evidence saying this happened, and so little saying it didn't. Why do you have to focus on the little bit that says it didn't? In fact, I, don't, I haven't really seen any evidence other than that photo where the front of the plane looks a bit pointy like a missile. And I'm like, okay, that just uh, <laughs> it could be some sort of the camera looking at funny. I, I just... It's just not enough. It's nowhere near enough. As for the missile, I'm not in the military, but wouldn't launching one from a base be a pretty obvious thing to everybody stationed there? I have a hard time believing that every single engineer on soldier on a base would keep their mouth shut for that long, and there's no way it was fired from the plane either. You can't just hook up an air-to-ground missile onto any ground vehicle that takes your fancy. You need the proper attachments, and these have to be connected to the cockpit so you can launch it with the press of a button. Am I supposed to believe that the hijackers hurried and set all of that up before takeoff with nobody noticing? <laughs> you just look out the window and there's a dude installing like a surface-to-ground missile on there and be like... Why? Hey, 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 stewardess, there's a man attaching a surface-to-ground missile to this plane. Why? Should we be concerned about that? I know airport security was pretty minimal before 9-11, but surely they would have noticed someone sneaking in 2,000-pound laser-guided munitions. I think we can safely say that Flight 77 hit the Pentagon. There's probably a listener right now that's frustrated how quickly I brushed off the Pentagon theories, but I feel that they simply fall apart the moment you look deeper into them. Yes, because you're absolutely right, Jaron. And anyone thinking this is just... No. No. Come on. <sighs> Next up is Flight 93, the one that crashed into a Pennsylvania field when the passengers fought back against the hijackers. The first theory we'll cover is that Flight 93 was shot down by the United States Air Force once they learned what was going on. I'll be honest, this is probably the most believable conspiracy theory in this episode, but it still doesn't have any evidence to back it up. Yeah, and that would be like, okay, yeah, okay, a hijacked plane is headed toward Washington, D.C., and there's already been two mass casualty events, and now the Pentagon's been hit. Yeah, shoot it down. Totally reasonable. And if the government wanted to cover up, sure, I could believe that. If there was some evidence, I I'd find that very easy to believe. But would they hide that? I why would the government hide that? They'd be like, yeah, we shot it down. Okay, we killed a hundred civilians, but we had to. We're really sorry, but we had to. It was an executive decision, and that's how it works. I'm really sorry, but that's how it works. It is what it is. Fighter jets were indeed scrambled to intercept the aircraft, two F-16s, but they didn't have time to get armed before taking off. The pilots were actually prepared to ram the hijackers. They'd already agreed that one of them would ram the tail and the other would ram the cockpit to take the plane down and hopefully minimize collateral damage. They never got the chance, though, as Flight 93 went down before they got anywhere near it. So yeah, it's honestly possible that they shot it down and covered it up, but that's just pure speculation. Theorists also point out that a standard crash doesn't account for how spread out the debris was at the crash site, with chunks of metal flying for over a mile and some smaller pieces, making it several miles before falling back to the ground. For it to travel a mile? That doesn't seem at all unreasonable. It's a giant plane that is crashing into the ground at hundreds of miles per hour. It's gonna go places. But multiple experts have shown that this is not only possible, but actually expected. Yes, one of the engines, for example, flew for about 900 feet or 275 meters. Its location is completely consistent with the direction the plane was traveling, and with its airborne speed, it would have only needed to fly forward for a few seconds after impact to make it that far. And yes, the engine was found only 900 feet from the rest of the fuselage. Don't listen to many conspiracy websites I found claiming that it was found several miles away in the opposite direction. That is just a straight-up lie. Among the sites that don't lie, though, it still seems odd to me that they expect a heavy, fast passenger jet to crash into the ground and just stay neatly in one place. 
Additionally, the black box recorders for the plane were located two days after, and a fair amount of human remains had to be picked out of the wreckage. Some explanations state that the real Flight 93 actually landed in Ohio, and that a second dummy plane was crashed into the field in its place, and that the passengers were disposed of or hidden away. Why? <laughs> so, you, there's a plane that's going to crash, and what you've done is you've taken that plane and killed all the passengers, and then you've put a fake plane in the why why what's the motivation you've got the same results and it's obviously a lot more hassle to do it the conspiracy way why you go through all the trouble to set up a fake plane crash if you plan on killing all the passengers anyway is a mystery indeed now let's not forget flight 93 also had passengers make phone calls to loved ones and the police when they realized what was happening according to the fbi a total of 37 phone calls were made during which the passengers learned of the unfolding situation and described their plans to storm the cockpit so, how do you explain that away? Were they just confused, or was it an elaborate government plot with voice-modifying software, as some have suggested? <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'd be pretty pissed if I sacrificed my life to take down some terrorists only to learn that everyone thought had actually landed at a secret NASA base and then been disposed of. <laughs> I don't know. However, it is, there's gonna be like if you're involved in something this big, there's gonna be some conspiracy theories, and you just gotta be, you just gotta be like, okay, people are stupid. Gotta move on with my life. I mean, you can't move on with life because you're dead, but like, you get my meaning. The Twin Towers. Now, I finally arrived to the most commonly held beliefs: those surrounding the collapse of the Twin Towers and Tower Seven. So let's start with the Twin Towers. At its core, the conspiracy theory states that the collision of the passenger jets and the burning of jet fuel is insufficient to explain the complete collapse of the buildings. This is the origin of the jet fuel can't melt steel beams meme, because steel's melting point is 2,750 degrees Fahrenheit or 1,510 degrees Celsius, while jet fuel burns between 500 and 1,500 degrees Celsius but Fahrenheit or 420 and 815 degrees Celsius. So the burning fuel is allegedly insufficient to explain the melting of the tower's structural beams. This is the one that I always feel is like super obvious, isn't it? It's like, you don't need to melt them, they just need to become weaker. And if that's enough to weaken them, then there's a fat lot of building that's on top of them that's going to collapse down. And then when that collapses down, it's going to, you know, there's a whole lot of building below it that's going to collapse down. It's not that complicated, is it? So how did they collapse then? Well, this brings us into the controlled demolition theory, the idea that the real cause of the collapse were bombs placed in the basement of the towers and that the planes were just a distraction. Eyewitnesses supposedly heard shaking and booms from the lower floors before the collapse, and on several videos you can see the windows near the base of the towers explode before those above them do. Isn't that just going to be pressure? Like, increased pressure is going to break windows. Like, if you push down on something, the bottom bits are going to break as well. The lobbies were also visibly damaged long before the towers fell, which is odd considering that the impacts are more than 80 stories up. On top of all of that's curious, debris falling down the elevator shafts, maybe? Not sure about that one. On top of all of this, the way the towers fall down does indeed look like a controlled demolition would, with minimal damage to nearby structures as they collapse straight downward, falling at near free fall speeds. Well, again, isn't that that's how it's because when they design buildings if there is a catastrophic problem like this or a bomb or whatever they are designed to con like not just fall over and smash up half a city the backers of this theory aren't all crackheads though and there are actually some pretty intelligent people that stand by it say for example steve e. jones who has a phd in physics and is known for his work in muon catalyzed cold fusion this is another issue i have so this guy is smart smart people believe in conspiracy theories and he's working on cold fusion which i mean also isn't that a pipe dream uh but irrelevant the thing is i think just because you're good at one thing doesn't mean you're good at everything and people often think that if you're successful or clever at one thing that means that you're good at other shit as well which is just not the case yep and this guy is not a structural engineer he's got a phd in physics that's very, very different fields, you know? It would be like, okay, Bill Gates is smart. Let's get his opinion on this. It's like, yeah, but he's, it's, his, his smartness doesn't have anything to do with this. In 2005, Jones published his findings, saying that after analyzing the dust from the collapse, he found traces of red and white flecks, apparently byproducts of thermite explosions, 
as well as iron-rich microspheres. I found one of his papers from 2007 detailing his analysis of the collapse. I was able to follow along during his explanations of how photos of dripping molten metal have been seen and how white puffs of smoke coming out of the building are indicators of thermite explosives. He also takes a sample of dust and runs a magnet along it, pulling out the metallic bits so he can take a closer look at them under a microscope, leading him to find the iron-rich microspheres that I just brought up. Now, I'm no chemist, but apparently the existence of these spherical iron bits means that the metal was at one point molten. Okay, so this is like interesting because it wasn't, it shouldn't have been hot to melt the things. I was thinking it just has to weaken them, no? This is interesting. Jones goes on to say that only thermite explosives could have brought the iron and steel to sufficient temperatures to create these microspheres that he found in the dust samples. By the way, if you're wondering, the dust samples he analyzed were mostly gathered by a woman living down the street from when, uh, the, when the towers collapsed. Apparently, the dust flew through some of the holes in her window and she collected them in a jar. That is not a particularly solid chain of evidence or enough. That, that is super weak. That is not good enough, uh, especially because there would be tons of dust. Go get some dust from somewhere else and run more trials on dust that is more clearly evident, fr evidently from the site. That's not good enough at all. This is one of the first times in a conspiracy that someone has actually brought forward legitimate evidence, or at least legitimate enough to someone like me who isn't an expert, so obviously I needed to keep digging. When reading more about Jones, I found out that he was a professor at Brigham Young University in Utah, and as I happened to live just a couple of hours' drive from there, I wondered if I might get the chance to ask him a few questions in person. Legend! Unfortunately, it turns out that he went into early retirement from his professorship quite a long time ago, and the receptionist I spoke to didn't have any way to contact him. Good for you, Jaron. Thanks for, I mean, good effort, mate. After looking into it a bit, it turns out he actually accepted early retirement under some serious pressure after being put on paid leave by university administrators once he started posting his 9-11 papers on the school's official website. Uh-oh. So, while I would like to bring you more analysis on those thermite byproducts and microspheres, we're going to have to move on. Again, I just, there's not enough data there, there's not enough information, and also that chain of custody for that dust is not fucking good enough. Like, if this really is a thing, there'll be other people collecting dust and doing these same studies and looking into this more. The fact that that hasn't happened and that this isn't accepted is just points to this just not being a thing. There's no one else who's got some dust and has done this at all. Come on. To start with, reports of booms and shaking in the grounds before the towers went down are simply incorrect. Seismographs placed 21 miles north of the towers picked up the whole event. On their graphs, you can clearly see the impacts of the planes register as a sudden bump in the graph, graph and then a short while later, you can see a much larger spike of the crumbling towers. Conspiracy theories. Okay, so we're looking at this now. Wow, that's so crazy. You can see these on this graph. It will be on the screen now. That's really interesting. Conspiracy says that a collapsing skyscraper wouldn't bring about such sudden, intense seismic activity, and that the only explanation for this abrupt shaking is explosives. Here's the graph for you. The huge red and black spikes are each of the towers collapsing. But this right here is a classic way to misrepresent data. Notice at the bottom of the graph, the x-axis shows uh, the chart covers a whole 30 minutes of data. Yes. But the collapse of the towers only took 8 to 10 seconds each. So, of course, in comparison, it looks like a single spike. Take a look instead at the graph with a shorter timeline of only 40 seconds. I'm looking at it now. It's on the screen as well. Here we can clearly see the expected seismic activity. No sudden massive spikes indicative, indicative of explosions, showing the longer timeline that squishes the results is just outright deception. Yes, and not surprisingly. As for the whole jet fuel can't melt steel beams thing, well, you're right. If you place a steel rod in burning jet fuel, it's not going to turn into a liquid. It will, however, get really, really hot, well over a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. And for a structure to collapse, its support beams don't need to turn into molten lakes. They simply need for their structural integrity to fail. At 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit, steel loses nearly half of its strength. And by the time the fires rage their maximum temperature of at least 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit, and in some pockets up to nearly 1,900 degrees, the steel support beams that would directly expose the flames would have lost as much as 90% of their strength, which is not enough to hold up a building. And remember, fuel wasn't even the only thing burning. The fuel that remained after the explosion was merely the ignition for everything else in the building. Carpets, rugs, thousands of desks, furniture, everything remotely flammable in those offices was quickly engulfed in flames, letting the fire advance 
vents at a rapid pace, and it wasn't just localized to the impact point as burning fuel seeped through vents and elevator shafts, weakening the steel around it at every point. Fireproofing spray was either scraped off during the collisions, damaged in the explosion, or was simply insufficient for the immense heat that they were now facing. The steel floors began to sag, sinking under their own weight, pulling the walls in and putting immense strain on the steel bolts holding each floor in place. Then, a chain reaction, and as one floor near the impact site gives in and collapses, it slams into the floor below it, which immediately caves in and falls to the next floor. A fast, powerful process known as pancaking, which brought down the entire structure. This also explains the white puffs of smoke that people saw shooting out of the windows. This is dust and concrete being blown out as the floors collapse onto each other. The National Institute of Standards and Technology NIST, was commissioned by the US government to officially investigate the structural failure, and their report identified flaws in the fireproof coating as one of the main reasons why the fire was able to deal so much damage. Now, there are probably people already typing in the comments furiously about how none of this is possible and I'm a traitor that's fallen for the lizard people lies, but study after study shows that this is likely what happened to the building on that day. And yes, those studies are peer-reviewed, unlike anything you'll find on a 9-11 truther site. And that's it, like that guy with his steel balls and stuff, instead of losing his position at the university, it would have been peer-reviewed and studied, and that's not what happened. So... What now? What's next? But wait! You're still furiously typing. What happened to the black boxes? You know, the indestructible flight recorders placed on every passenger jet. Well, they're not indestructible. They're just really strong. After all, these were never located. Well, you're right. They were never found. But they're far from indestructible. Exactly. Even the ones found in the wreckage of the other flights, the Pentagon and the one that crashed into the field, were both partially damaged. And they weren't even the ones to get crushed under a million tons of steel and concrete. But wait! They continue, if the black boxes were destroyed, then how is one of the hijackers' passports found on the street? Surely that would have burned. Well, that's not always the case. First of all, the passport wasn't found inside the collapsed rubble, where it would have likely been squished. It actually fell to the street after the impact. Light paper debris actually survives a plane crash more often than you'd expect. Japan Airlines Flight 123 crashed into a mountain in 1985, killing 520 people on board. In fact, it was a rather violent crash, with one wing clipping the ground, causing the aircraft to flip over and explode on the mountainside. But miraculously, Many of the handwritten farewell notes written by terrified passengers were later found because they were able to blow far enough away from the crash site to avoid being burned. Oh my god, that is insane. <laughs> I had no idea about that. I mean, I know about Japan Air uh, 123, but I didn't know about those notes. That's really terrible. We can't cover every single talking point in this episode, so here's a few rapid-fire debunkers. Number 1. The molten substance visibly dripping in some photos cannot be proven to be steel or any other metal. It could just as easily have been glass. Number 2. The surgical seaming cuts in the base of the towers are exactly that. Surgical. Rescue teams used thermite torches to burn through steel supports in order to save people trapped underneath. These were made after the fact. They were not the cause of the collapse. Number 3. U.S. Geological Survey examined dust samples and found that the red and white thermite material was likely flakes of primer paint and, according to other experts, thermite explosives would be too slow to be useful in a controlled demolition regardless, and there would have needed to be so much of it used that someone surely would have noticed it being planted ahead of time. It's also possible that the use of thermite in the cleanup process contaminated dust samples that were later examined, which is why they contained said iron microspheres. And while we're at it, there is actually not a single shred of evidence provided to prove that these dust samples were actually taken from the World Trade Center, which is supposed to take people's word for it, which is ironic. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, the chain of evidence is just not good enough there. Number four, the World Trade Center attacks are not comparable to the time a World War II era bomber hit the Empire State Building. That plane was a B-25, significantly smaller, significantly slower, and carrying far less fuel than a Boeing 767 that struck the towers. And yes, it was a B-25, not a B-52 Stratofortress, which is an absolutely massive plane. If you've heard that it was the much larger B-52, you probably watched the original Cut of Loose Change documentary that I mentioned earlier because in their first edition they mixed up the planes when talking about the event and apparently didn't notice before the release, which is kind of sloppy if you ask me. Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. Like, getting them the wrong way around. Sounds like something I could screw up in a YouTube video, saying like B-25 when I mean B-52. But when that is a large part of your conspiracy theory, 
Come on, guys. Come on. Number five. Structural engineers argue that the reason the towers fell in such a straight manner is because it's the only way possible. One of the towers actually had a bit of a tilt at the top, but a skyscraper that massive can't possibly lean very far, as this would put so much stress on the building below that the supports would just give out and it would simply collapse like it did anyway. It's just too heavy to tip over sideways and take out half of Manhattan. Okay, well, if they're not, like, I was saying they're designed to collapse in on themselves, like, the, uh, or this reason, it's like, whatever the reason people thought about this, because you can't just have a skyscraper fall over and destroy half Manhattan. That would be crazy. Number six. At the time, these were the only high-rise steel towers to collapse due to an internal fire, but it has since happened to more notable structures. The Wilson Pace de Almeida building, a Brazilian 24-story building that collapsed in 2018 due to an electrical fire that started on the fifth floor, and the Plasco building, an Iranian 20-story building that collapsed due to a fire originating on the ninth floor. Anyway, I could go on all day on this one, so let's just wrap things up with the last tower. Tower 7. Lastly. We have Tower 7, which was unfortunate enough to get damaged during the attacks and collapse later that day. A lot of the conspiracy points here are similar to the Twin Towers, so we'll run through this one briefly. First of all, Tower 7 wasn't hit by a plane, so people were already super skeptical of its collapse. This was made worse by the fact that the BBC accidentally reported its destruction 20 minutes before it actually happened, and the building's owner, Larry Silverstein, was recorded as saying to the fire department, We've had such a terrible loss of life, maybe the smartest thing to do is pull it. They made that decision to pull, and we watched the building collapse. People cite this as him agreeing to detonate the bombs and bring the building down as well. To add to the suspicion, the CIA and various government agencies had field officers in the tower, so was this simply a convenient way to destroy evidence of planning the attacks? <laughs> Wait, their way of destroying the evidence of planning the attacks is to be a part of the attacks? That's crazy. Just burn all the documents beforehand and leave your bloody building alone. Well, no. The collapse here was similar to the towers. After being struck by falling debris, the building caught fire and several floors burned for nearly seven hours. The collapse of the other towers had disrupted the water source for Tower 7 sprinklers, and the quote about making the decision to pull was actually about pulling firefighters out of the building and deeming it a lost cause. Thousands of people watched the building go down, and none of them heard any explosions. The only eyewitness report of explosions is from one man who was exiting the building when he heard them. So should we believe the one single guy or everybody else who was there and saw the whole thing happen? Everybody else. Again, look at it. There's overwhelming evidence and a small bit of evidence. Just go with the overwhelming. That's the biggest thing. There's more of it. That's what you should believe. The fire weakened the steel supports in the center of the building, and in a similar way to the other two, one of its floors gave in, causing the whole thing to come crashing down. This was made even easier by the fact that falling debris carved out ten floors on the center-facing side so deeply that the center of the building was exposed. If you watch a video of the collapse, you can clearly see that as cracks form across the building, the east side begins to slump, and as it collapses, it pulls the west side down with it. This one actually did tip a little bit to the side as it fell, hardly what would be wanted in a controlled demolition. Wrapping up. So, at the end of the day, we're left with three conclusions. Number one, the US government initiated the attacks. Number two, the US government was aware of the attacks ahead of time and let them happen. Or, number three, Al-Qaeda was behind the attacks and there is no conspiracy. Everyone knows where I, what, what my feeling about this is. It's just clearly number three. <laughs> what happened to 9-11? There's a terrorist. And they attacked. And lots of people died. The end. The yeah. end. Look, if the US government did it, we're left with more questions than answers. Sure, they allegedly did go to war in the Middle East, but think of how many people had to be involved in order to pull the whole thing off. You need planners, recruiters, pilots to train the hijackers, explosive experts, people to move thousands of pounds of bombs and into the World Trade Centers, people to set them off, all while keeping the whole thing a neat little secret. We're talking potentially thousands of people, and no one has said a word in over 20 years. Also, if we're buying into this conspiracy theory, how far are we going? Was it planes that hit the Twin Towers, but a missile that hit the Pentagon? Did the Twin Towers fall from the planes, but only Tower 7 had to be brought down with explosives? The problem with these elaborate conspiracies is there isn't a straight story. There's just an enormous amount of suspicious talking points, but not all of them are compatible in a single narrative. I'll give them this though. One of the reasons the theory is so popular is because not many of us would be shocked to hear that the US government had done such a thing. The CIA has a pretty bad track record since its inception. Yeah, it's true. Like, <laughs> I was about to say I would have put it past them. Obviously I would. Like, CIA's done some sketchy ass shit, 
no question. They got a podcast now, by the way, like official CIA podcast. It's not biased at all. But would they do this? No. I don't, I really don't think so. And let's not forget that Al Qaeda took responsibility for the attacks. Initially, they denied involvement and begged the US government not to invade Afghanistan, but they also took back what they said, and their English propaganda magazine, Inspire, has even featured articles debunking conspiracy theories. Can you imagine? <laughs> you just like plan those terrorist attacks, and you're like, yeah, 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 it was us, it was us. And they're like, no, it was the US government. It's like, oh, for f sake, you know how much planning went into that? You know how hard that was to organize? A little credit, man, come on. Another point I'd like to bring up here is in the days after the attacks, there was a vicious attempt within the government to pin them on Iraq, but every trail kept leading back to Afghanistan. If the US government's plan was to invade Iraq, why would they set up some super complex conspiracy that points at Afghanistan? They could have just easily said the hijackers were Iraqi and gone from there, but all the evidence led back to al-Qaeda. Option 2. Maybe the government knew about the incoming attacks and simply let it happen. In my opinion, this is far more plausible than believing they carried out the attacks themselves. What most people will bring up here is that the US actually received intelligence of the planned terror attacks earlier that year and ignored it. The daily briefing handed to the president on August the 6th, 2001, just a few weeks before it went down, was titled Bin Laden Determined to Strike in US, warning that Osama Bin Laden had operatives in the US that were planning a major attack. On top of this, a few of the hijackers had already been flagged by CIA as Al-Qaeda, but they had made their way into the country anyway because apparently no other departments had been informed. <laughs> Again, I don't think it's a conspiracy, I think it's just incompetence. The government's response to all of this was a series of statements talking about how, yes, they were anticipating an attack, but no one expected passenger jets to be used as weapons. And, yeah, fair play, government. Fair play. But this isn't actually true. Anti-terrorist organizations had already foiled a similar plot in 1995 known as the Bajinka Plot, where terrorists planned to blow up 11 planes over the Pacific, assassinate the Pope, and crash a jet into CIA headquarters in Virginia. Ambitious for sure, and they were very close to carrying it out. In fact, they were in the process of making their bombs when the plot was uncovered. Coincidentally, Osama bin Laden helped to fund and plan this attack, and it's clear that some of the ideas of the foiled plot made their way into the 9-11 attacks. In addition to the Bajinka plot, a joint inquiry found that there had been 12 reports in the last seven years warning of terrorists using planes as missiles. Egyptian, Jordanian, Italian, Israeli, and British intelligence all reported to the United States throughout 2001 that Al-Qaeda was planning something huge involving aircraft as many as 20 terrorists and large-scale American targets. The, the thing is, like, there's terrorist plots all the time. Terrorists are doing terrorist they're always planning stuff. And the CIA and MI6 and Mossad or whoever, they're always uncovering this stuff. And there's tons of intelligence. And of course, stuff that's gonna like this is gonna come across someone's desk. And the majority of the time, nothing ever comes of it. But the one time it does, we all look back and you're like, oh yeah, of course they should have seen this. But it's all the time. There's a lot of intelligence. There's a lot of people just out there gathering intelligence on horrible people. So yeah, the government was very much aware that such a thing could happen and that there were people actively thinking of doing it. Whether this constitutes prior knowledge or not, I'm not sure, but we can at least accuse them of being incompetent by letting known terrorists into the country. Yeah, that is like, come on guys, <laughs> get it together. When, I, I, when, you, when you fly to the US, you have to fill out this form as a non-American saying you're not a Nazi and a terrorist and I can't remember what it's called. You fill out, I think you have to fill it out online now and you print it out before you go. And then it's like, it's just some like, I'm not, I'm not a war criminal sort of thing. And <laughs> can you imagine doing it? It's like, no, I was, I am, I am. That would be a mistake. But apparently you just check, check that box and you're good. <laughs> I mean, you don't check the box that you're terrorist and you're good. You also need to keep in mind that the CIA operates on a massive worldwide scale, and these threats probably blended into the background noise of thousands of other reports, wiretaps, and intelligence leaks. It's just thanks to hindsight that they stand out to us now. Though conspiracy theorists will be quick to point out that it wasn't just the government who had knowledge ahead of time, and all you had to do is look at the stock market. It was later noticed that in the weeks leading up to 9-11, a lot of put options were placed on airline companies. These are the options that will be profitable only if the company's stock plummets, so it seems like a clear mark of insider trading. A peer-reviewed study from the University of Illinois and a group of Swiss financial experts have also come to the same conclusion. I don't really have a way to disprove this, but I feel like if someone had told a bunch of business dudes on Wall Street that 9-11 was going to happen, somebody would have spoken up. But let's clear 
one thing up. A big part of the foreknowledge conspiracy revolves around the owner, Larry Silverstein, getting a massive payout for terrorism insurance, which he purchased just months before the attacks. He even took the insurance company to court, arguing that he should be paid double, as the separate towers should count as separate cases, and he won $4.5 billion in the settlement. Sounds ultra suspicious, so let's break it down. First of all, Larry Silverstein purchased a 99-year lease for the Twin Towers in June 2001 and was immediately contractually obligated to insure it. The insurance plans that he and his investors chose automatically had terrorism coverage included because back then this was pretty much standard with every all-risk commercial insurance plan. After all, the idea of a devastating terrorist attack seemed far-fetched. Although there was a bomb, 1993 World Trade Center bomb, right, where they tried to take it out the first time. It's not like he went out of his way to hurry and add a terrorism clause. It was just the nature of the policy. And remember, the World Trade Center was bombed in 1993, and its owners were also fully covered then, but nobody bats an eye about that one. Finally, we have option three. That Al-Qaeda, in their blind hatred for the United States and Western civilization in general, plans the most devastating attack that they could envision and carried it out on September the 11th. 2001. The towers collapsed from the weakened structural steel, not bombs. The Pentagon was hit by a plane, not a missile. And Flight 93 went down in a field when the passengers revolted, not because it was shot down by a fighter jet. You can decide which of these narratives to believe. Just remember, if your whole argument is based on stuff you've seen on 4chan or Reddit, perhaps it's time to consider investigating some more credible sources. Yes, indeed. Obviously, I believe none of this nonsense. And yeah, hopefully we've... Uh, cleared some of them up thank you for watching nailed it on the time by the way what did i say just less than an hour boom